to another webinar of DPA. Today we are going to talk about invoicing. We have our partners here of Tri Finance. Um, I'll give the floor to Steve. He will give a brief introduction, and then we can start. Thanks, uh, Marina. Um, I'm here with uh, David and Martin of Tri Finance, uh, partners of TPA, and with Orlando and uh, Marina of uh, TPA, and we will um, start. Uh, this, this webinar as a series of webinars on transfer, transforming the world of tax. And today we will dive into e-invoicing, not only from a commercial perspective, but also from a VAT perspective. Uh, we saw a lot of, uh, of the people who joined have a indirect tax background. So um, I think that's uh, very relevant. The, the introduction, uh, short introduction from my end, uh, why are we doing tax on technology um, and, and are looking at, uh, in, in particular today, in order to cash um, workflow where, where that invoicing is going to be important. Uh, just a quick overview on, on the, um, the household rules. You can ask questions uh, by typing them into the box of the GoToWebinar um, if anyone uh, has a question, please raise them right away. We will have about 10 minutes at the end of, uh, of this session to address uh, um, other questions. Um, so feel free to uh, to jump in. Uh, after a quick introduction by uh, Orlando on why tax and technology combination is, uh, is important, uh, Martin and uh, David will take over, tell you all about the basics of, uh, of invoicing tell you about Apple, the pan-European public procurement online, very long words, but uh, a, a, an open platform being embraced by a, a wider group of uh, countries than just the EU. Uh, they will, together with Marina, talk about closing the VAT gap, um, so, so which financial processes are already um, e-ready and which, which are not. And uh, after looking at a few country-specific uh, nuances, they will bring you a roadmap uh, of, uh, of what to do next. Uh, it's quite an interesting story. Um, let me hand over the floor and give the floor to Orlando for uh, why tax and technology are relevant. Orlando? Thank you, Steve. My name is Orlando Feimer, and um, I walk you through the agenda introduction. Tax technology plan, invoicing Pebble, uh, which is an example of encouraging government to promote actually invoicing. Then we have the example of invoicing, tax compliance, and um, implementation will be basically uh, touched. And at the end, we have about 10 minutes for Q&A. So next slide. We see from most of our customers and clients a significant compliance challenge for, for multinationals. And we as TPA work intensively together with different stakeholders, obviously CFO with the finance departments, uh, the head of procurement, head of tax, and head of legal and regulatory. And Steve already asked the question, why on tax and technology? What you actually see is that um, governments um, are increasing the regulatory compliance, which basically means that yeah, the bar is increased, uh, how companies actually need to report and how detailed they need to report. And there's, of course, a significant cost associated to that if all that is being done without significant uh, technology. Then you have the tax compliance by itself. Uh, tax laws in different countries are not harmonized uh, so much. So you need to, if you basically want to do it in an efficient way, you need to understand how you basically can uh, cover the, the compliance aspect. And then, of course, financial systems within companies and the ERP systems are made to, yeah, to, to manage the company. So the finance compliance of having up-to-date information at the top of your fingers to make the necessary decisions within a corporation or company is key as well. So 
you go to the next slide, we then actually see that you actually have the three parts that need to be taken care of by the different stakeholders. Now, why on tax and technology we see actually agents of a change? That is basically the, the difficult word, but it's the politicization, uh, which is venting uh, uh, quickly. Um, so there is a need um, that more and more, I would say, yeah, tax laws are being made um, and need to be taken care of. Uh, and there we actually see that, um, yeah, uh, of and the number of laws are, are significantly increasing. Then we also see that the digitalization is advancing quickly. Uh, it's on the one hand the expectation of, uh, I would say, um, stakeholders, but also stakeholders within the corporations, business uh, managers want to have their at the, basically want to have their yeah, business and financial information to manage the company, uh, yeah, basically every second or every minute, <laughs> whatever you uh, choose. So it needs to be readily available. Uh, but also um, the expectation from the tax authorities and governments are increasing. In many countries, um, a digitalization requirement is actually in place for a number of taxes where um, you only in a digital way can uh, comply with the uh, with the request of the tax authority. And of course, if you bring that all together, you get to the transformation. And what we see actually with many clients and in the market is that uh, the advancing of the transformation to a more, to a higher level of digitalization for the tax uh, uh, line is advancing not with the speed of the politicization and the digitalization requirements. So there is a lack, and that's actually why we uh, bring this uh, this webinar to alert you uh, that there is a need to work on the transformation. Next slide, please. So these days, the head of the tax and the tax department. Um, they are actually in the middle, and they are actually being squeezed. They are being squeezed on the one hand by the tax authority, where the compliance is is getting more and more important, but also the digitalization is is more and more important. And on the other hand, it's the executives and the CFO um, basically um, mentioning that you know. There is not enough budget to comply with everything unless you basically made this transformation into more digitalization. So there's actually pressure for the tax departments from both sides. Right. And that is actually why TPI Global is focusing on the tax and technology plan. I just want to show a very, let's say, um, high level. Um, um, yeah, walk through on how such a cycle of transformation actually can work. And obviously, you start with the objectives, where main challenges are being uh, defined, and there you, of course, need to yeah make a selection based on the, the company and based on the requirements which tax flows uh, uh, can and need to be automated. Then everything starts with the people and the organization and governance structure. So it's important that uh, you have to buy in of the of the organization, and obviously you need to select the workflows. And obviously, you start with defining the complex and non-repetitive workflows. But at the end, you choose those that are simple and are most repetitive to be uh, automated first, because that, from my perspective, is the low-hanging fruit. And four is the output and the reverse engineering. So basically, you start with what do you need to deliver and how do you get that in the most efficient way. Then the next point is the functionality selection. Define the technology. And TPA has many partners with whom TPA is working together and can manage that for you. The sixth point is the project implementation, so a complete 
the implementation plan in detail will be made with a, a timeline uh, to actually remain in time and in, within budget for the whole implementation. And at the end, you have the testing phase and, of course, go live uh, phase. Um, so that are the seven phases that we actually define as TPA. Next slide. This is an example of a, I would say, tax process phase automation um, of a VAT um, transformation and automation. Uh, what you need to take away from this before I go into all the details is that we actually do this in about eight weeks uh, time from the process mapping towards the testing uh, phase and the um, basically the go live phase and obviously the design implementation phase are, are in between. There are a lot of details behind but what you need to take away is that we do this within the time frame of, of eight weeks most of the time. Yeah, Orlando, maybe um, uh, an addition um, uh, an addition to uh, to this. This this was one of the the project plans where HMRC is putting a digital bat return mandatory for April one, and uh, this is like okay, if this is the requirements for that bat return. How do you work your way back into the the data? <clears throat> where uh, as you see from the uh, first box. RACI matrix workshop uh, also defines the, the people involvement, not only the external people, but I think the most important, peop uh, the most important feature is uh, uh, people first. Uh, so people, process, uh, and technology is sort of the sequence we believe in. Uh, that's why RACI matrix workshop uh, tries to get all the stakeholders in, on, on board. And also David and Martin will, will address that point later on. Sorry. Thank you, Steve, for this addition. So next slide. And we actually hand over to David and, and Martin. And I'll give the word to David Busby of TriFinance. Thank you, Orlando. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we start off with uh, the basis uh, of e-invoicing. Um, a lot of misunderstanding about what an e-invoice is. And let's start off with an e-invoice is not a PDF invoice. Uh, we all know the paper invoices that we have sent by envelopes and by, with a stamp to our clients. And um, in the last few years, the PDF invoice takes more uh, of a regular standard internationally. Um, but really, we are talking about now an XML in, uh, invoice. And XML is the ab abbreviation of extended market language. So it's a digital file with text only. Um, the good thing about XML is that as a human being, you can even read the text file because uh, compared to other digital uh, languages as uh, HTML or um, uh, VBA, it's, it's more code, uh, code language. Um, but XML has the certain information on it uh, as we are known for, as we're used to on the paper invoice, a PDF invoice. The only difference is, is that this invoice is now able to communicate between systems. So it's a direct system-to-system -system communication uh, model uh, instead of a PDF, which is still an optical um, way of uh, presenting an invoice. Um, so where does the XML invoice is seen in the, in the process? If you go to the next slide, you see that um, from Purchase to pay point of view, um, an invoice can be a normal PDF or a paper invoice is still received by your client. It has to be collected uh, digitally or on paper. Somebody has to authorize it, and the creditor needs to type in uh, in your system. Or if you have an OCR system, it can be uh, read automatically, and then it, it, it creates line items in your administration. Uh, after that. Um, Internal communication takes place, and then internal authorization for payment takes place, and then in the, in, in the end, you can pay your invoice. With XML, a lot of steps are taken out. For example, the collection and the authorization cannot all be used uh, and can be done um, automatically by, by a system. So your invoice is received and directly 
put in your administration. That's the big advantage in process times uh, types of, uh, uh, of, your of an uh, invoice. Um, if you go to the next slide, there has been some developments over the last years, and I'd always like to address the invoice maturity levels, uh, where paper invoices was the normal standard. Later on, we scanned them in and created a PDF uh, file and used that in our systems. Um, if you go to level three and level four, you see that larger corporates uh, adapted uh, portals and also EDI connections. And EDI is an electronic data interchange channel where already digital digital formats are shared between systems. Um, and actually, from the EDI system, the XML has been raised for more broader use and for more, for more companies. Um, if you go to level five and six, this is where we are talking about now, where you can send invoices through a service, a service provider platform or even with a fourth party model. And about the fourth party model, we will uh, continue in the next slide. But um, if you're talking about future, uh, the, you, see, you see more companies are adapting self-billing. And to be very short about self-billing, it means that you as a client uh, order certain things at your supplier, and at the same time, you create an invoice that you're going to pay yourself. So your supplier is not sending an invoice to you anymore, but you create your invoice yourself. That's the, the basis principle of self-billing. That process will be uh, be out of scope because in the next slide we're going to discuss a little bit more in detail what the um, model uh, level five and level six where we are talking about now uh, mean. You have two sizes, two types of models in the XML: the th three corner model and the four corner model. Uh, where the three corner model is a connection between suppliers and buyers, but always in between an, uh, a service provider. And what you see here is that suppliers uh, from the one side have a certain format in the, in the XML uh, that has to be at the same level as your buyer. So you have to agree on what type of e-invoice you're going to send. Uh, later on, we're going to deep, deep, make more deep dive in the, in the differences between the XMLs. Um, but what you see is that your service provider is a more important link between the us in your communication chain. Um, in the next level, you see you have a four-corner four corner model where it doesn't really matter anymore in what format you're, you're going to send your invoice uh, because there is a fourth uh, step in between. And it's a standard, standi standardized format UBL XML uh, platform, for example, Pebble. Later on, we're going to explain more about Pebble. But the idea is that if you have your system on your side, using XML invoices in your dialect, in your language, specifically for your business, you're going to send it to your uh, service provider, and service providers A and service provider B will translate that in the same language so your buyers can um, receive their invoices in the preferred format. This is the solution for the difficulty of the three-corner model where you have sometimes discrepancies between languages in XML and uh, you need a translation uh, tool to um, to communicate with each other. David, is, is there any question on the platform already? No? I, I, I have a question. How many of, of the clients, the multinationals, yeah, how many of the clients of the multinationals are under level five and, and six, assuming seven is still an exception? David, any, any is that a, a, a hard, hard guess? Hard guess right now. I think it would be the majority will still use the three corner model globally. Yeah. I would expect uh, because the four corner model, um, yeah, Pebble supports the four corner model, but is mainly in Europe in certain countries. And in Europe, the percentage would be higher. Yeah, yeah, that's what okay. that's what I would guess. Hey, my name is uh, Maarten Pronk. Um, just like uh, David, uh, David mentioned, I would like to uh, tell a bit more about uh, the Pebble network. 
Um, the Apple Network is a uh, good example of uh, how uh, governments are uh, encouraging the, the promotion of uh, the use of e-invoicing. Apple is, was uh, initiated, initiated by the European Commission to promote secured digital communication in Europe. Um, it's not only for the use of, of e-invoicing, it's actually uh, established uh, in 2008 and went live in 2012 for uh, e-procurement, so e-orders, uh, shipping notes, uh, e-invoicing, et cetera, et cetera. At the moment of time, uh, 28 countries uh, in Europe, plus Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Singapore, and the US are using the um, the, the, the Apple platform. Next slide, please. When we look at some more facts uh, about the, the Apple network, is one uh, important thing which will be uh, addressed more in the, the next slides, but it's free to choose your, your own uh, access point um, in any country. And uh, well, uh, once connected with, uh, with one, you're connected to, uh, to all. It's an open model. Um, and important to see is that there are, uh, you just uh, pay an, uh, an amount uh, for your own, uh, the use of your own access point provider. But you're not paying for the, the access point provider of your uh, business partners. And one of the most important uh, yeah, things to, to know about the Pebble uh, is that it's an, an highly secured um, uh, network. So once you're validated by your access point provider, you can be sure that all other business partners on the network are validated as well. So this will reduce the, the chance that, uh, for instance, the CFO fraud or any other type of invoice fraud will, will, take, uh, will take place. Next slide, please. At this slide, you see the, the 13 uh, um, Apple authorities, which are uh, named for each, uh, each of the, the countries. And next to these uh, Apple authorities, there's a non-profit organization called Open Apple, which is an international organization under Belgium law and consists of both public and private members. The association has assumed full responsibility for the development and maintenance of the Apple specification, building blocks, and its services and implementation across, the, the, across Europe and the rest of the world. So the solution providers in countries without an own authority in their country are working with open Apple in order to provide their customers access to the Apple network as well. So this makes, you, uh, makes, it, makes it possible to uh, work with the Apple network outside Europe and, uh, and the, the countries named before. Next slide, please. As mentioned in the previous slides, I would like to get to connect, if you would like to get to connect to other organizations in the Apple network, you can well, what Apple stands for. Apple is the the, the pan European public procurement online. Thank you. Well, as, as as mentioned before, if you would like to connect with other organizations in the in the Apple network, you can choose your your own solution provider, which should be a certified access point provider. Next slide, please. After connecting to the Apple network via the access point you've chosen, you're able to send and receive invoices with any other organization within the network. Once you're, once you're, connecting to the, uh, once you're connected, you can perform an automated check of which of your business partners are already on the platform. So from that point, you can start the so-called onboarding process in which you can discuss with your business partners which information is, is required on the invoice. This enables you to send the smallest amount of detail with, within your invoice. The downside of this method is that it's sometimes hard to predict how many of your business partners are actually on the network before you're actually on the network itself. 
This is one of the reasons the adoption of the Apple network is going just step by step, since organizations with large amount of invoices have created their own solutions over the past year, like EDI, for instance. This is, I guess, uh, part of the, the question uh, Steve asked before about why why are the large co uh, corporations uh, sometimes not on the on the Apple network because they've already uh, created their own uh, solutions for their high amount of, of invoices. In the next slide, I would like to take you through to the emergence of invoicing since the year 2000. So around 2000, the compliance regimes were all around the world were mostly post audit model. Tax purposes, this model means that tax audits will take place every year after the business transactions have taken place. And over the years, globally, countries discovered that this model has disadvantages for your taxpayers and tax authorities. So this model um, has also a major reason, is, is the major reason for the tax evasion. So at, at the moment of time, in the year 2000, the first layer of scale innovation of invoices saw the light, for example, the Nordic countries, like Norway and Sweden, which the government starts uh, stimulating e invoicing. And this providing e invoice in the same legal status as a paper version, stimulating platforms and e invoice standards. So over the years, what you see, if you go to the next slide, um, you see that in 2015 already, the clearance approach uh, raised. And the clearance, um, uh, and then what you also mentioned on the notice on the on the on the world map that Latin America adopted it first, um, and also Turkey is in there in, in Europe. Uh, they started to adopt the clearance approach rather than the post autumn model, which um, uh, which supported actually the government in and they closed their VAT gap in an, uh, in a high uh, in a high order. So later on, we're going to explain what the clearance model means. But if you go to the next slide, you see that in 2020, um, it spreads more over the world. And also, um, uh, the compliance regimes today, in 2020, more cl clearance models have been introduced. And in in still, each country is adding its own flavor to its invoice landscape. Some countries even have made the e invoicing and B2G mandatory. Some introduced such called the real-time transaction control system. And this transaction control system has the last name of all systems, which is mentor, monitoring real-time or near real-time transactions, mainly between the vendor, the supplier, and the tax authority. Our expectation, we expect that in another 10 years, this will be taken over globally. Why? Um, the world will will digitalize quickly like uh, orlando already mentioned and the advantages of ha having this this clearance model in a digital way uh, is for every country there so um we expect that this will take over in the next 10 years globally uh, but be aware that every country has its own idea of and, and own their own processes in, in tax uh, tax income so over the years, a number of flavors will uh, will rise all over the world. Okay, thank you, David. Um, now I'm going to talk about so what this means for VAT. So when you take, for example, the the Russian example in Russia, they have automatic VAT control systems for medium and small companies, where the cash register is already connected to a system and uh, payment systems are also connected, so that's the way the government controls uh, invoicing and also cash flow. And in Italy, uh, you need to submit your your invoices, your info to tax authorities, and they also give you error messages if something you're invoicing is not uh, correct. In Spain, for example, there's also a self-assessment system, SII, that you can use for tax control uh, improvement. And a lot of these systems, a lot of these countries in the in the map currently, they use CFT-based uh, systems. That is basically CFT is an international standard for electronic exchange of accounting information. So we see, for example, these countries on the list, and we taking from the example of uh, David, the countries in the map going even more red or even yellow, we can see that 
next steps are definitely coming and the map being completely read by 2030 is not uh, is not such a such a realistic scenario yeah if you if you add to that uh, marina the, the impact of uh, technology because we're, we're looking at that here but if you look at uh, uh, country by country reporting for direct tax uh, which is just another template um, it's, it's very hard for some direct uh, tax people to assume real-time uh, assessment of the country by country reporting but that sort of in the in in a similar phase if you if you look at uh, exchange of information on customs that might not be as advanced yet but it will follow the same uh, cycle uh, we expect uh, certainly also um, exchange of information in a digital format whether it's uh, it's it's wages tax or individual income tax um, it is is next on the line so if you if you have six means of of uh, of taxation you're looking at and you see how tax authorities use tax uh, use technology to monitor tax behavior um, almost on a real time base then I think you you see that um, the world looks quite different already two years from now. So back to. Um post mo post audit model and uh, the clearance model um, the post model the post audit model is the model where in the end one yearly or at least a period of, uh, in a period of time uh, vat is uh, vat income has to be uh, uh, charged by the by the government and the clearance model is where the government is in between so there are three ways of um, a normal way of uh, sending an invoice you can as a supplier you demand your buyers that the invoice uh, line is in in a certain way or the buyer is in in, in this case leading and says okay i only want to receive uh, invoices in, in this certain way um, and then you have the platform the the, the info, invoice platform like a pebble right, where it doesn't really matter in what type of invoice or what type of uh, line you you invoice to each other uh, but all of them are in a post audit model the clearance model is where the tax authority is in between the supplier and the buyer so that means that in some way um, the invoice digitally should be sent through or sent via the uh, the, sec the tax, uh, tax authority so if you go to the next slide you see actually there is a triangle there uh, between the supplier the buyer and the, and the tax authority well this is very um basic so let's i would take i'd like to take you along with two countries uh, that is in this example for example hungary um the process is as follow you are able to send your xml or your invoice to your buyer directly but at the same time the tax authority uh, asks you to send it to them uh, digitally and in return you'll get a digital validation number back and that is for the uh, tax authority of hungary uh, and registration number so they know what invoice you have been sent to your buyer at the same time you're obliged you're obligated to store your uh, invoice in a digital storage system in, in in that country so if you go to for example brazil the same people are involved but the flow is different so first you send your e your invoice to the tax authority you'll get a digital stamp back with a specific number and only when that stamp is on your invoice you are able to or you're allowed to send your invoice to your buyer so in both ways in both models there is somewhere a registration number or a stamp by the government but the flow to your uh, to your buyer is different and this makes the the global invoice story a little bit more complex because these are two only two examples uh, but there are a number of examples and a number of tax authorities in those countries who demand their own way of sending invoices and tax um, and, uh, for, and for your tax uh, um, for your tax authorities, authorities. yeah 
So these are only two, two examples, and there are more exotic ways of uh, sending an invoice to your, to your buyer. So be aware that if you are handling globally, um, make sure you know what the country uh, is, uh, is demanding. Thank you, David. Um, I would like to uh, tell a bit about the, the main differences in uh, worldwide e invoicing. Just like uh, David mentioned, uh, each country has its, has its own uh, e invoicing structure. Sometimes it, uh, you're, you're free, to, free to choose if you would like to uh, make, make use of an, uh, an infrastructure an network. Um, but sometimes the you, you, the, the infrastructure is mandatory for, for instance, the business to government, the business to business, and there are a lot of different invoice, invoicing standards around the world, like the, the UBL in Netherlands, or the Exrechtnum in Germany, or the, the CFDI in Mexico, and all of those standards have their own space in, in e-invoicing and their own specifics within the XML format. Sometimes there are even more standards and dialects within one country. So that makes it uh, hard to, uh, yeah, to adopt when you're uh, not uh, using the right uh, software solutions. There are quite some differences in archiving regulations as well. Sometimes you should archive your invoices uh, for five years. Sometimes, sometimes it's 10 years. And sometimes it should be archived in a specific country, or and are there uh, even invoice systems in which in which the tax authority will arrange the archiving function for you? Since e-invoicing is sometimes fully mandatory, these concerned countries have specific fines as well. This can be an amount per wrong invoice or a part of the impacted revenue. There are, are countries in which an office location can be closed due to the fact of not following the e-invoicing procedures. Like we mentioned before, the e-invoicing networks are mostly not only about invoicing, they uh, are using other documents as well. Like for instance, in Mexico, uh, you, you are re required to send your pay slips via the, the, the same clearance model as well. An important Different in the, the worldwide e-invoicing is the uh, if e-signatures or uh, other ways of uh, proof that your in integrity and authentication are uh, are sometimes mandatory. Some, sometimes you need to uh, work with certain uh, providers, and sometimes it's free of choose. And then the acceptance and re rejection is quite different for each country as well, because sometimes you, for instance, you need to cancel the invoice in an online uh, portal within 48 hours, or you're not allowed to send an, a credit note, but you should cancel <coughs> the invoice, et cetera, et cetera. Just like David mentioned, each country has its own regulations. And last but not least, in a lot of these countries, there are exceptions possible or foreign operating companies. So the question, if you are actually located in a country where your uh, customers are, is there a real important question in this, uh, this differences we see in worldwide invoicing. So as mentioned before, each country has its own impact on your business processes. Well, let's have a look at the, at the next slide. Yeah, this slide, thank you. When we have a look at this slide, we have, we have, uh, we've put some uh, systems, some, some countries, uh, as an example, uh, to show uh, the impact on the business processes and the impact on the, the, your system landscape. When we look at the, at the, the traditional paper forms or uh, less, tra less traditional uh, the web forms, you see there's a, a minimum impact on your uh, business processes and a minimum impact on your system. When you're, um, when you're 
having business in some of these countries, and you know that, that these countries are more on your uh, the right hand. So, for instance, you're doing business in India, Italy, Brazil, and Chile. You can imagine that uh, the, the impact on your, your, your system landscape and your businesses is quite high. The time between the, the moment you, uh, you're, you're able to send your invoice to your customer can, can get quite, quite high. So, and, and that having in mind that other countries like, for instance, the UK, Poland, and Greece, we see them moving up towards the right part of this, this chart. You can imagine that it's, it's quite important to uh, yeah, start looking for global partners to help you in uh, staying in compliance on, on, uh, on, on matter of fact of e-invoicing. Yeah, a point uh, I want to bring to the attention. We, we see a lot of that, uh, a lot of that uh, technology is being promoted on a local base. And if you look at the picture like this, um, and you say you have an ERP, ERP system which uh, generates the data for those uh, e invoices and everything else, pretty much on an, on a siloed base, uh, and you need to move to a digital ecosystem. Why? Because otherwise, if all those countries move to the right box, uh, you as a tax person have to explain to your commercial sales and operational people they can't run their business anymore because the invoice cannot be set. Well, that's that's obviously a, a situation you want to avoid. So I think uh, what Martin uh, rightfully says is don't go for uh, uh, what looks like a cheap solution in the UK to do a VAT technology which works in the UK only. Then you still have not uh, uh, conveyed a, a digital ecosystem impact, namely uh, that invoice from the UK will leave to India or, or worse to Brazil and Chile and, and therefore not not be acceptable uh, based on that e-invoicing e compliance set of regulations there. So I I think in, in what we see in, um, in helping our clients doing the vendor selection, uh, the, the, the vendor selection on that technology cannot be, if you're really international in 10 plus countries, cannot be a standalone solution in one country only, unless you want to do it 10 times and, and then you need to pray, I think, that those systems talks to, talk to each other, which typically with one trick ponies on a local base is not the case. So this is a, a, a serious health warning, I think, from this uh, presentation that you, you don't want to meet your commercial and operational people for this reason and make sure the digital ecosystem impact is, is limited and you have a VAT technology platform which uh, which can cover all these SPACs in, in one go. And there's only a few systems out there, we know. But uh, uh, it's, uh, it's almost like gambling. You could bat on the wrong horse very easily. Um, so back to you, Mark. Yeah, thank you for that uh, addition. I guess when we're looking at the, at the next slide, uh, we're looking at the, the timeline for the for 2020, and I guess I guess it's it's um, important to see that there are lots of countries with, with, which are uh, setting e-invoicing mandatory for the for the, this short uh, time in, in period. So. Uh, for instance, Portugal is making uh, large business uh, e-invoicing mandatory, and at the end of the, uh, this year, for all all business, e-invoicing will be mandatory for business to business and business to government. But in the end, we already see have seen some delays this year. For instance, India, who has postponed their uh, mandatory guidelines, and the coronavirus is a uh, 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 so as will be impact on this agenda as well. So now I would like to give the, the word back to David. Considering all the changes that will come, and considering the world is, is changing around us, and also taking in, in, into account that in a lot of countries, uh, invoicing is mandatory. Tax law. Uh, 
uh, it's time to create an overview for yourself. Uh, if you're a company that's working abroad or have clients abroad, this is important to take action now. I think uh, the, the warning signal that Steve just, Steve just gave is very important. And I, uh, I, I approve that message. So what would help you to uh, solve this problem is look into your own company. So make a situation sketch of your own company. Uh, look into where your revenue is coming, where your revenue is coming from, and also look into what kind of customers do you have. Is it business to government? Is it business to business or business to consumer? Because all those three businesses is different in e invoicing. And also make sure that you fully are aware of what your local presence is per country. And like Martin already mentioned, there are some exceptions per country where if you're a company abroad, uh, those tax compliance rules do not apply yet they will in future um, so if you have that in place look around you and look into the countries right now how the situation is there what are the regulations in the country what are the announced regulations in the in future and also what are your requested required IT infrastructure uh, that has to be in place in terms of storage and privacy and security and you probably will notice that there will be a gap between your East and your Seoul situation. So make sure you are aware of what, need, what steps you need to take in the coming months, years perhaps, to be sure that you are still tax compliant in future. Uh, make the gap in analysis and make it also an impact. So what impact does it will, will have on your, your own business? And like Steve already mentioned, make look around for a selection of technology solutions because technology will help you to solve this problem because if we go to the next slide a very important message is there are two options you can do from as from today option a you adapt a uniform global strategy um, and make sure that you're applying to all regulations in one time there are software suppliers in this uh, around the world who can help you to do a one-time right implementation of your invoicing strategy. It will even increase your digital maturity level. In the beginning of the presentation, I showed you the, pro the process flow that will help your business um, cut out a few steps if you're implementing invoicing internally. Now, you're mandatory in, uh, you're mandato uh, it's mandatory in certain countries to to do so. So now take the advantage of invoicing and adapt it in an organized way. Because option B, if you adapt all local solutions one by one, country by country, in a timeline, you will create a maze of systems. Systems will change. Regulations will change. And if you are uh, uh, monitoring yourself, um, it's going to be an, it's going to be a hard task to uh, to keep an overview and keep up with the time. Uh, if you do that, you will decrease and reverse your digital maturity level, and I, I promise you that will the, the process internally will be longer than you're used to in paper invoices. So, uh, one one point there, um, the. Uh how is there balance but in today's world when uh, uh, Corona is uh, is making all companies struggle for cash? Well, I think that's clear. I, I think everyone wants the invoice out being accepted right away and be paid the next day. So you you can see if 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 you're in a an, an, an disconnected world like we live in today, where the economy is in a total reset, and you are running the option B. I know. Um, I know teams within multinationals who are struggling uh, on option B because they need to get Russia fixed um, uh, and, and they, they're spending probably five, ten people to get that fix done, uh, but they never stepped back and, and looked at option A, uh, which means that they probably need to double the, the, the team of four or five people because there will be more option B troubles down the horizon as well. And, Especially in these days, it's very hard to explain uh, from a tax perspective uh, why um, uh, the, the VAT is, is making you lose cash instead of uh, save cash. And I think that's, that's an important message around this as well.
So please take this process very seriously. Um, I like to compare the implementation of e-invoicing almost with an ERP implementation. Why? Because a lot of uh, a lot of things need to be happening in the, in the next certain time. Um, we have an, an, a strategy approach, and we start always with a business case. Make the impact, uh, make the is situation, make the gap analyze, and know what you have to do. And also manage the expectations, uh, manage your people, because um, a lot of people in your organization will be involved in this process. It's not only the, it's not a finance party, it's not only a tax party. Also, your uh, IT department, your uh, operations department, your sales department will all be involved in this process because the way of invoicing uh, will change uh, dramatically. Um, it's an IT-based uh, implementation as well, so make sure you met you, you have an, a quick overview of your technical requirements. Um, but don't forget about compliance. So talk with your accountant and talk with your auditor to be able and with your tax advisor to make sure that from your side the tax compliance is in order. Also, it's a, it's also a people people management change program where uh, a lot of people will be involved. Is there enough um, knowledge available? Is there enough um, uh, uh, technical and support, uh, project support available to support this project? And all, it's all about communication. Everybody in in the organization need to know what something is going to change and because a lot of questions will come to you from your suppliers. So what will be your communication style and what will be your timeline in communications? Um, to be able to make the right decision in what technical solution you're going to start start up and request for proposal project. So make, if, especially the companies who have a number of international uh, companies abroad, um, make sure that you find your technical partner who is able to support you. And there are several, several in the world who can help you. So if you want to make the, the right decision, um, make an RFP the document, send them out, um, let them demonstrate you and show, your, show their best, um, uh, best solution or get help to, uh, to do so. Um, so our main message is in, be prepared. So before you start your journey, um, you first plan your route properly. Uh, otherwise, you will get lost in the, in the mist. Um, my name is David Busby. My name is Maarten Pronk. Yeah. Thank is you. There, is there any uh, final questions on the list? Let me see. Let me know. Um, I don't think. Please fill in your questions. Uh, no, I think uh, the person who asked was Apple has already got their answer right away. Uh, one question I have uh, for you, David. Uh, if you run 60 countries uh, of gap analysis, uh, will that take, uh, like you said, this, this, these type of projects, as we've seen, is almost like running an ERP, but then on e-invoicing and VAT, ERP, uh, if you if you phrase to tax people the word ERP, they they are scared away because <laughs> that's two years later down the line, and yeah. maybe maybe VAT functionality lands into the ERP, but mostly it, it might be missed as well. Certainly on direct tax, by the way. Uh, so so what is the the average time? If you have 60 countries, you have a kind of one ERP package, uh, pretty straightforward setup. Uh, how long will it take? Um, recently, we uh, did a uh, project for even more than 60 uh, countries, and it took us two, two months to get a very clear overview of all those countries, what's uh, there in place. Uh, and that was only uh, looking into their uh, tax compliance rules, uh, technical requirements, and, and making a roadmap uh, from external point of view to look into what, what still needs to be happening. Um, 
but in future, there's, it, it, it depends on certain things, on your, your own technical uh, solution. Um, if you're based in those countries well, or are you, if, you're, if you're invoicing from uh, a headquarters somewhere. Uh, so it depends a lot, but in, it, it takes a few months to uh, get a clear overview of uh, at least 60 uh, companies, I would say. Yeah. Okay. And, and taking into account the technical requirements from a corporation. Perspective yep. as well, so two months is, is relatively fast, and I think that it became clear that there's now a kind of burning platform since in Europe now the large countries like Germany and Poland, Germany in November 2020 yep. is requesting e-invoicing for all business to government, and um, Poland uh, as also a large European country is doing that by by 2021 and includes also the B2B uh, uh, aspects uh, as well as all. Uh, communication to tax authorities. So, uh, and keep in mind, November 2020 is in six months from now. So, there is not a lot of time to to start with this with this project of invoicing. And that yeah, TPA is of course willing to help you with that, and also try finance. So, in case you have questions, please contact us at your convenience. Um, we just received a question from Alexander uh, Sirin. In the scope of archiving um, the data online, are there any regulations on the server on which country the data needs to be archived? That's a very good question. And the answer is very simple. It depends on the country you are working in, unfortunately. Uh, there are countries who um, uh, say it's mandatory to store it in the country itself, and there are countries who say it's no, that doesn't really matter as long as it's digital um, accessible for us to uh, to do an audit. And also the, the matter of uh, the length of storage depends on the country. Uh, the minimum is at least seven years, what we've seen, but it could be uh, stretched to 15 years. So somewhere between seven and 15 years, you should be able to, uh, to store it. Uh, but the location depends on the, the country, unfortunately. So looking to the time, I want to thank everyone participating. Thank you for listening, and we, we hope to be in contact with you very soon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. I'd like to see you in the, the next uh, event uh, on trans transforming the world of tax. Uh, um, enjoy your uh, day. This is the end of uh, this uh, this webinar.